Hey everyone, my name's Jenny and I'm the Kids and Online Pastor here and I want to welcome you to Bear Creek AG's online service. Thanks so much for being here. We wanted to take a few minutes and share a few things with you and your family, so check this out. If this is your first time with us today, please take a few minutes to fill out as much of our Digital Connect card you are comfortable with. You can find our Digital Connect card in the main post section of this service. From there, you will see a link that will send you directly to the card. Tonight kicks off our first Christmas party of the season with the young adults holding their annual Friends Miss at 6.30 p.m. There will be games, food, and giveaways. Don't miss out if you are a young adult. Contact Alex Tees or Mallory Fuller for more information. Our ladies ministry team is gearing up for our annual Christmas ornament swap next Sunday, December 13th from 4 to 6 p.m. Bring a yummy treat to share and a wrapped ornament to swap. You can contact Lee Fuller or Sherry Tees for more information. Don't forget about all the ways you can stay connected with your church family throughout the week. We have our online campus with live prayer on Monday nights as well as in-person prayer, Tuesdays together sermon recaps, Wednesday night Bible study, Bible plans through the YouVersion app, and so much more. We also have a new podcast channel where you can listen and stay up to date on the go. We hope you check out and use these resources to stay connected all week. Please don't forget to check in with us in the comments as well so that we know you're watching today. We look forward to seeing all of your smiling faces pop up online. Thanks so much for joining us online today. all this morning in the house of the Lord. Welcome to any of our guests. I'm looking out here. I think everybody's been here before, but we're so glad to have you back with us here on the Sunday after Thanksgiving. And as we transition, if you would, get your Bibles out. We've got a few scriptures. I don't have a, uh, I, I don't even want to say I've got a thought today because it sounds like I'm unprepared. I have a message today, but really it's a thought that the Lord laid in my heart. And I just felt like it was timely for the season that we're in and definitely as we go into the Christmas season. And it's, it's funny, it's, I find it difficult to transition sometimes. It's hard because Thanksgiving is like just two days ago and everywhere you go they're singing Christmas songs and there's Christmas stuff and and I love to celebrate the birth of my Savior, but there's just something about it. Just it, to me, it just happens too quick. But I'm not preaching on Christmas today. Uh, that will come, and maybe next week, the week after, we'll see how the Lord leads me. Um, but I just want to just say thank you so much for all of you that that were here last week and online. We had several people. Thank you guys online who sent in your digital praise card. I mean, powerful testimonies of, of you folks out there, and I'm glad that you're joining us here live this morning online. But I was just thankful of all the praise cards last week. And, I, you know, they're private and they're personal, but I could, I could tell by some of the praises who, who wrote them. I really could. I'm not going to mention who wrote what. I mean, I, I know it sounds funny because there's really nothing really funny in the sense of ha-ha on them, but it was interesting as I could read some people, uh, some people signed, but most people didn't, which is fine. I told you to do anonymously. And it's just amazing. I say, yep, I know who that is. I know who that is. Because why? I know what God has done in your lives. And I'm praising God with you for his goodness, for his faithfulness, for his love, for his people. And it's just amazing to see God's, God's hand up on our life. The only disturbing thing that I had um, from the praise cards was I was really alarmed by how many people thank God for coffee. <laughs> Seriously, I'm thinking, dude, we're, all this, I thank God for coffee, I thank God for coffee. I know what we're going to be fasting in January when we do our fasting at prayer night. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to mandate coffee. And, and it wasn't all young people. Some of them were thankful for Starbucks coffee. And I won't mention Charlotte Dula's name on that one. She's not here to defend herself. She's out there with our kids. But it was, it was a thrill to see. And I'm proud to report to you guys that we took up over $4,100 in our sacrifice offering last Sunday. Amen. Praise God for that. I give God praise. 
Um, had someone say, well, pastor, are you disappointed? I'm never disappointed in what God lays on your heart to give. Right? It's not I'm shaking you down. Matter of fact, if you remember, I didn't even mention the offering to the very end last week. And, and we made one blurb each week about reminding you about it. And I know for all that y'all that are new to the church, you weren't aware. But that's it. We just give God praise and we thank Him for what He's done. And we bring a sacrifice offering. And so hopefully after the first of the year, I, let me get through Christmas if you don't mind, church. And we're going to try to transform this uh, sanctuary with lighting and do some things in here to brighten up and put a lot of LED lighting over y'all so, um, so it's brighter in here. Amen. I don't know about you. I just don't like the darkness when I'm preaching. I want to be able to see you guys, and I want you all to be able to see me as well. And if you weren't able to give last week, it's not too late. If you give online or give in the offering today, just make it a sacrifice offering, and Miss Mary Lou will know what it goes to. Amen. Um, The other thing I want to uh, do this morning, I want to acknowledge we have a, we do have a, I I was mistaken, we do have a first time guest today. We do. Uh, Theodore James uh, Hood is in the house this morning, and uh, sorry, Miss Angela, didn't realize what's, but anyway, we're glad to have him in the house this morning. Little guy was born about, ooh, four weeks ago now, five, three, okay, hey, excuse my math, it wasn't too long ago, and uh, so glad to have him and mom doing healthy, and they're both healthy and in the house today, and just give God praise for his life. Last thing I want to point out to you um, is that we are going into December, and in February we will be having our annual business meeting. The reason why that's important is if you are a voting member of our church and would like to consider or pray about being a, a deacon, there's packets in the foyer. You can get one as you go. It tells you all the requirements, that what's required of you to be a deacon. And if that's something the Lord's laying on your heart, please get that. You're welcome to talk to our deacons who are already in office and see what it's all about. Serving with me It's not too bad. They keep re-upping, so it can't be too difficult to serve with me. Um, but it is a very important role in our church, um, not to be taken lightly. It's a, it's a position of service. You serve the church. You serve the pastor. And uh, you help formulate the vision for this church and uh, cast that vision. So if that's you, please get your packet today. Be praying about it. The reason why I announce it because it's got to be in the second Sunday of January. So please go ahead and get that. So anyways, y'all ready to start? Are we in the book of Acts? You in Acts chapter 20? As you do, i just got a few little comments here to make for you, uh, to you. What did the turkey say to the hunter on opening day of hunting season? Any idea what the turkey said to the hunter on? Any ideas at all? How about quack, quack? Opening day of turkey season. Quack, quack. All right, all right. You don't like that one? Okay. You've often heard you can count the seeds in an apple, but you can't count the apples in a seed. But do you know how many apples grow on a tree? All of them. And Glenda, Glenda just got it. I saw her. She goes, and she goes, <laughs> yeah, yeah, all, all apples grow on apple trees. All right. Boy, man, you guys, you guys sound like you're asleep today. Come on now. All right, here's your totally awesome but useless fact. The longest recorded flight, and this is important, of a chicken was 13 seconds. The longest reported flight of a chicken was 13 seconds. And your taxpayer dollars paid for that study, and I believe it was a Pentecostal chasing the chicken at that time. All right. <laughs> Acts chapter 20. All right. Well, my message today does, does have a, uh, a meaning to it. Um, and I want you to reflect a little bit on, on, your, on your early years of life growing up. Um, I mean, I know this is going to be a touchy subject, but how many love your parents? You just love your parents, even if they're not with you anymore. You love your parents. All right, that, that's good. You love your parents. How, but how many of you made notes when you were growing up that you would not act like your parents acted? Or you wouldn't say the things your parents Said, now, okay, now you're laughing. Now I've got you going. All right, all right. Uh, I remember growing up how my dad was always, he always had a book in his hand. If he wasn't fishing and hunting, he always had a book in his hand. He was always studying, and anywhere we went, he would talk to people, and he would talk about God. He talked about the Word of God. I can remember how impatient my dad was with me growing up, and I swore to the Lord in heaven that I would be more patient with my kids as they grew up. You can ask them how that's going. Um, I, I despised how my father always, I despise as a strong word, I greatly disliked how my father controlled the TV remote as I was growing up and would flip channels during commercial breaks. Yeah. 
Um, things you swore you would never say that your parents said. If your friends jumped off a bridge, would you jump off too? I can honestly say I did. There's a time I did jump off a bridge following my friends. It's Blackwater River. We went canoeing. But anyways, uh, one day you will thank me for this. And y'all can reflect. I see your head shaking. All right. Y'all got to wake up. You guys got to get vibed. I know you guys ate so much turkey. You're still having the turkey hangover this, this morning. So please, engage this message. It's not going to be long. Craig Seegers paid me $50 a few minutes ago. He's in the taller room to go really short today. So I'm going to go short to earn that 50 bucks. All right. For 100 bucks right now, if I get a hand for 100 I'll even go shorter than what I told him I would go for him. Any takers at all? Uh, my wife, wait a minute, that's my money. That's my money. You're spending my money. All right, our money, our money. All right. Or your parents said this will hurt me more than it hurts you. All right. Then suddenly you grew up, and as you grew up, you realized the huge shadow that your parents cast on you, that shadow in your life. And whether you say it this way or not, the reality of it is the shadow you lived in is the shadow that lives in you and influenced you as you grew up. I mean, we say those things, but in reality, they, they help make us who we are. It's kind of like the old song, Cat in the Kettle. Y'all know, I mean, Cat in the Kettle. No, I sing a parody of this song. The cat's in the kettle at the Peking moon. A little Oriole restaurant we eat at noon. And that's not it. It's actually the cat's in the cradle and the silver spoon, you know? you know. And as I hung up the phone, it occurred to me, my boy was just like me, right? That's the way the song goes if you don't remember the song. But um, before you know it, your, your, your wife will be telling you that, you know what? You're just like your daddy. You read and talk about God's word all the time, Right? The influence, the influence, you know. Yeah, that's what you heard her amening, you know. Or your kids get anxious when you ask them to help you with a project. Yeah, they get anxious because of, of the lack of patience. Or your family hides the remote from you. Happens occasionally, not too often. Or you say your kids, you say things to your kids you said you would never say and you're proud of it. The point I'm trying to make with that statement opening up to get you to think is we cannot escape the shadow of our parents. We cannot escape the shadow that our parents have, have set for us. And, and for some of you this morning, that's a beautiful thought. That's great memories because you had great memories with your parents. But for others, it's not. And that's not to bring up pain or hurt because I'm not preaching about the healing aspect of that. Although at the end of the service, there definitely will be a scripture that will help you in that healing. But the the reality is all I'm trying to get you to realize and acknowledge is that there were people in your life that cast shadows that influenced you, whether it's good or bad. And for some, it's an absence shadow. Or really, should I say that you live in a shadow of absence because maybe you didn't have your parents around the way they ought to have been. But every one of us were shaped under the shadow of our parents or some adult guardian, and it shaped who we are and it shapes who we will become. And that's a fact that we have to deal with today. And the reality is that we, we cast shadows ourselves. And that's what I'm trying to point out to you this morning. Just as your parents cast a shadow or adult, someone over you, a guardian, cast a shadow over you that affected you, influenced you, made a mark in your life, we have to realize today that we are shadow casters. We also cast shadows that influence those who live within our shadow. And it's important that we remember that uh, as, as we move into the holiday season of Christmas, as we move into a new year of unknown experience. I mean, we hope that 2021 is better than 2020. But can I be honest with you? My, my year 2020 hasn't been that bad. Yeah, we fought COVID, and yes, we've had all this going on, and I know it's affected people a different ways, but as I look at 2020, I, as we just said, I see the goodness and the faithfulness of my Lord who has provided for me. It's only when we go through those valley times that we really get to know who he is anyways. Amen. Not the subject of the message, but it's a good point to be made. God wants you to know that today. Without the hard times, you don't get to see his protection, provision, his banner. He is that high tower that you can run to when you are in need. But these people that live within our shadows, we can break them down. And I want you to think about this. This is a practical message today. It's not going to take you spiritually deep, but it's definitely a deep message. Because the people that are in your shadow can be broken down into three categories. There's those that live within the proximity of your life. 
Those people have no choice but to live within your shadow. My wife, I hope, doesn't have a choice to live within my shadow. My children don't have a choice to live within my shadow. My extended family, my in-laws, right? My one day soon to be daughter-in-law, as I mentioned that again. My grandkids, whenever they decide to come into this world, they will not have a choice but to live within my shadow. And then there's a second group. It's those who, who want to live within my shadow. There's people who make the choice who want to live. They see something about me or they see something about you. They say, hey, I like this about this person. Hey, I can hang out with this person. I, can, I enjoy being around this person. And those people do it by, by choice. This is friends. This is parishioners, church members. We choose to come together. We choose to live within each other's shadow. And then there's this third group that you influence accidentally, and I like to say divine accidentally. There's that group of people that you come into contact with by accident. It may be the person who serves you coffee-holics every morning at your favorite coffee place that you come into contact with every morning. That is by accident or divine accident, as I would say. They're not choosing to. It's not forced upon. It's because you happen to cross paths. Or your favorite restaurant that you go to every Wednesday after Bible study, like Coram. Several families in our church on Wednesday nights, you go to Coram. That waitress or waitresses, maybe more than one, you by accident. You're, they're not there by they're there by choice, but they're not choosing to live within your shadow. By hey, they really know you. Nor do they have to because of the proximity. It's a divine accident, as I like to call it. Or or maybe that that parent, that mom or dad that you sit next to at the the, the dance rehearsal or, or the ball game that you just come into contact with because of the fact that your children are playing the same sport or involved in the same activity. It may be that person you run into at the golf course or the disc golf course for you guys who are into disc golf. You know, I know there's a guy down at Bay Dunes who seems like every time I go down there, and it's not a lot, but lately it's been a lot. I got to play a couple times this week. But when I go down there, he's there, and now I know them by name. It's not, an, it's not that they want to be in my shadow. It's not that they have to be in my shadow. But it's a divine accident or a divine appointment, depending on how you look at it. Your child's teacher. The bank teller or the bank tellers. It's funny. My wife goes to the bank with me this past week, and they know me by name. Well, that's easy. My name's on the check. But I know them by name. I know Olivia. I know Sandy. I don't even have to see their faces. I can't see their faces. They're wearing masks and they're in the building and I'm out the drive through But yet I know them by their voice. But every Monday when I go to the bank, there is a divine accident where we cross paths. All these people live in your shadow under your influence. And whether you know it or not, they are looking at you wondering if you're the kind of person they want to be like. Now, we don't frame it that way, do we? We don't, we don't frame it that way. But you know how you think about people who you live within their shadow, don't you? You see the way they act, what they say, how they present themselves. And you know really quick whether you want to be around that person, associate that person, or even be anything like that person in any way. And then you take in the concept those people that you divinely accidentally meet that you cross paths with, and if they know you're a Christian, now they're looking at how you interact in front of them, around them, and with them from a Christian standpoint. They're going to watch how you react when the umpire calls strike three on your son or your grandson. How are you going to react to that umpire? Isn't that right, Margaret? I'm going to use your legal name so nobody knows I'm talking about Elaine Clements here this morning. I can honestly say I never witnessed her, witnessed her losing it with an umpire. I never physically witnessed it. But you know what I'm talking about. They're looking at how you, how you tip the waitress. How you complain about when your coffee isn't made just right or your meal didn't come out just right. It doesn't mean you don't tell them, hey, you know, this wasn't what I ordered. But how do you react? How do you respond? They're watching. Trust me. They're watching. They know. And they're looking at you. And they're trying to decide, are you a person they want to interact with or someone they want to be like? And especially if you are a Christ follower. See, based on what these people see, the shadow you cast will help them determine whether they want to be a Christ follower too. See, that's the biggest knock we have on Christians today. Listen, the church is full of hypocrites. That, they no longer can use that. We've acknowledged it. You're right. We say we want to be this way. 
And we're striving to live this way. But reality is we know. See, I had that conversation with God this morning. I, had that, I said, God, I, 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 why me today? Why me? I, I don't know why you've called me to fill this pulpit. I don't know why you would have me stand behind this sacred desk and present this message, this word, each and every week. God, who, who am I? I? I'm projecting something. I'm trying to say this is the way we ought to be. In reality, I don't meet up to that standard. See, I, I, I get that. I struggle. If you think that I think I'm holier than you, I, I'm, I don't think that I'm holier than you. If anything, I understand where I stand in the hierarchy of holiness. and I am nowhere up here. No, by no means am I up here. See, and, and even I, it, the church is full of hypocrites. But what we have to do is help people understand that we don't get it right, but we strive to get it right. And we, we, we want to compel them to be like us. Don't we? Do you live a life that you want someone to live like you? And act like you? You should. Paul said it this way, follow me as I follow Christ. What do you mean by follow? We use that word, I'm a Christ follower. Well, where are we going? I can't move for the camera. Sorry. Where are we going? Pretend I'm moving this way, right? It means that my life, I'm following the example that Jesus set and the words that he left us to live by. And so that's, that's what we're trying to do as an individual, as a Christian, as a follower of Christ. And based on how we live our life, we'll determine whether other people want to be like us. Everybody wanted to be like Mike. MJ. Michael Jordan, right? Be like Mike. Because why? He could fly. I believe I can fly. I mean, he could play basketball like nobody. I mean, it was amazing how he could dunk, it seemed like, from center court when he was young. Everybody wanted to be like Mike. No one could stop Mike. He could shoot. I mean, of course, back then, it was a little tougher because of hand checking. I think he probably was the best, the greatest player ever to play basketball. Different times. Anyways, it's not about sports. That was somebody online that likes basketball. I can tell you that's who that was for. <laughs> I came across this scripture last week as God was dealing with me and ministering to me on this message. And I probably have read this scripture, without exaggeration, probably a hundred times. It's in the book of Acts. We're about to read it together. And just to kind of let you set the tone for what Paul is writing about, he, he, he is finishing up what probably might have been his last missionary journey. We don't know. I don't need to split hairs, but we know he did three missionary journeys. There's some talk that he had a fourth one. There's some evidence to that. But either way, the Holy Spirit has laid in his heart as he's going back to Jerusalem to give a report to the Jerusalem Council about the, the churches that he's planted, the churches he revisited on his way back. He's going through all the, some of the churches he had planted, and he's meeting with them. And while he's doing it, the Holy Spirit comes upon him and says, Paul, when you get back to Jerusalem, you're going to face imprisonment and infliction in your life. You are going to be afflicted. You're going to be imprisoned. And it's not going to be a good time for you. And, and the Holy Spirit impresses upon him. So what he's doing as he's getting ready to go back to Jerusalem, he calls for the elders of the church in Ephesus, the Ephesians church. And he calls for them and he says, listen, I want to encourage you because I may not be able to come back and see you again. I don't know what is ahead of me. All I know is that imprisonment and infliction is what I'm about to face. So with that in mind, no matter what happens to me, this, this is what I want to be remembered by, or this is how I want my life to matter. This is what really matters, is what Paul is saying. Understand that right now. He knows, he doesn't know if he's going to die, but he's got a good idea, but he definitely knows that he may never come back to this church or these churches ever again. And this is what he says. This is the statement he makes about his life. Verse 24 of Acts 20. But I do not account my life of any value, nor as precious to myself, if only I may finish my course and the ministry that I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. What is Paul saying? What is he saying? He's saying, listen, in the face of uncertainty, in my life, nothing matters. My life doesn't matter. But what does is, my, does my life make a difference? Or maybe a better way to put it is, what makes his life matter is what he does with his life. He said, I, my life doesn't matter unless I fulfill the call, unless I fulfill the purpose in my life. All he want to do is finish the life God has set before him 
to complete the ministry God has given him or had given him. What was his ministry? Well, he tells you right there. We think his ministry was to plant churches. Yes, that was part of it, to encourage you, yes, write letters, yes. But in reality, he tells us what his ministry is because it's every believer's ministry. He says, to testify of the good news of Jesus. He says, my ministry is just simply to tell others about how good Jesus has been, to cast an influential shadow for the kingdom of God. An influential shadow for the kingdom of God. That means that everything he said and done would bring glory to the kingdom of God. That was it. The great apostle. He sums it up in that one state. The man who wrote two-thirds of the New Testament that, that drives our lives as Christ followers. All that matters was did he fulfill the call God gave to him and testify of the goodness or the grace of Jesus Christ. For a shadow to have a lasting impact, and that impact would be what? People would remember. His impact is what we remember about Paul. All that matters is him to leave a positive mark. Now think about, think about Paul's life. We could talk a lot about Paul's life. We could talk about the beatings and all this, the shipwrecks and, and the traveling. We remember him all about that. But I want you to think about that. That's a broad shadow. I want you to think about for just a minute. Who are the people in Paul's life his shadow influenced? Well, I can think of Timothy and Titus. Two young men who God called into pastor and, and then Paul mentored them and placed them over churches. Timothy and Titus. Great books to read about as he wrote letters to them to encourage them. How about Luke? Luke? Yeah, Luke. The one who wrote the book of Luke? The one who wrote the book of Acts? This man traveled with Paul and wrote many of the letters that Paul, because of Paul's eyesight, we believe in, and Luke traveled with him. And the, and the impact that Paul's life had on Luke gives us two books of the New Testament. The history book of the New Testament, it's more than a history book, I know, but it definitely lays out the plight. And then Luke's investigative research on the life of Christ. He was not a disciple. Luke was not a disciple, but he went and investigated the life of Jesus based on what other people said about Jesus, what other people, well, basically what they had said about him. And he wrote the book of Luke that is so and powerful and affecting our lives. Think about this. How about governors Felix and Festus? You don't know about them guys probably too well, do you? But these are guys, when Paul got to Jerusalem, when he arrived in Jerusalem, he was in prison. He had to go before both these governors. And yet, what did he do when he defended himself? He didn't defend himself. He proclaimed the gospel. He fulfilled the word that was spoken over him that he would be in the presence of royalty and present the gospel. Felix and Festus. How about King Agrippa? Remember, he didn't receive the message and he didn't give God glory, but he also got eaten up by worms because of that, right? That's, you better be careful to give God the glory. Come on, church. I don't want to lose you here, but I'm trying to help you understand the shadow that Paul cast. King Agrippa, the wealthy man by the name of Philemon. The book has a letter was written to him because of his uh, because of his slave had escaped him and was converted. And Paul was sending the slave back to Philemon, Philemon, and said, "Hey, look, receive him." Those two people, the other travelers who were shipwrecked with Paul. Hey, you know what? If we all stay on the ship, we're going to be okay. Okay, now we got to go. Hey. Think about the impact. The, the other soldiers who were chained to Paul while he was in jail, when he was in house arrest, when he was in the dungeon in Rome. Those guys who saw him pray, who, who, who heard him telling Luke to write this or whoever else may have been writing his letters for him. See, what was the shadow? He was casting a shadow. The people who were members of the churches he's planted. How about you and I? The shadow that Paul cast 2,000 years ago is still affecting you and I today. Powerful shadow. Paul left a mark wherever he went. And I believe it's God's will for us to do the same wherever we go, whoever we interact with. God wants us to cast a shadow that influence those around us for his kingdom. And that's why we exist, is it not? Is it not that we exist to be the light? Is it not that we exist to be the salt? We are here to cast a shadow, a positive shadow, for the kingdom of God. You know what one of the saddest things I can think about for a person's life? Is to live an invisible life. Whether you lived, whether you died, it doesn't matter. 
to live a forgettable life. That, I think that's the biggest shame in the world. That's the, the saddest thing in the world. To live and not be known that you were alive. See, everyone in here has a shadow. And there are people living within that shadow. And God wants us to leave a mark on them that leaves a legacy. A legacy in their life. Paul said it best. But my life is worth nothing to me unless I use it for finishing the work assigned me by the Lord Jesus to work. The work of telling others the good news about the wonderful grace of God. You know, I've lived long enough and I've had success in different areas of my life and realized how empty success can be if it's not eternal. If it's not eternal success, then it's empty success. What value does it have if it doesn't impact eternity in people's lives? I struggled with that when I worked for the largest paper company in the world at the time. I worked for a subsidiary that was, I was employed by International Paper Company. That's who it was. I worked at Arizona Chemical, but it was owned by International Paper. And I made good money working for that company. I was the wide area network administrator. What does that mean? Well, that just means I traveled all the plants and made sure their, it was, <laughs> made sure their networks were running, installing computers, upgrading. I, that's what I did. and paid me good money to travel. Traveled all over the southeast, the plants, working on it. And, and, and I was very successful for being 28 years old, making a whole lot of money. Owned boats and cars, a house. I mean, young as I was, I was... Back then, that was doing something. Remember, I'm older than most of y'all. Well, most of y'all I'm older than, not all of y'all. And I struggled with that because there was emptiness in that success. Emptiness. I couldn't do it. I had to do something. Because why? My calling was to pastor. Now, not everyone in here is called to pastor, but you're called to make a difference wherever God plants you. And the success in your business or in the corporation you work or whatever it may be, whatever it may be, it, it has no value if it doesn't have eternal value. You have to make a difference to where you are. And I want to give you five quick things this morning. I told you this is going to be a practical message today to help us go into this Christmas season, into 2021, to reevaluate. One thing about holidays is we kind of lose focus. As much as I love Christmas, we focus on the Christmas theme, and it's great. But, you know, it just seems that the coming and the going, the traveling, the celebrating, it just causes a good chaos, but a chaos in our lives. And, but I want us to be focused this Christmas because I can tell you right now, I saw some folks yesterday in a store that I won't mention that weren't leaving a very good shadow in public. And I think we have to be mindful of this, what God has called us to do. So very quickly, five things to help your shadow be impactful, all right? So if you're a note taker, get your pen and paper out, get ready to write this down. Get your phone out, but thou shalt not Facebook, Twitter, or any Instagram or anything else. Thou shalt only use your notes app this morning, okay? You ready? Five things. I want you to grab these things when it comes to your shadow. First thing is your shadow has influence whether you want it to or not. We, you have to understand that people are watching, and if they're not watching, they're in your wake, if I can use that, if you know what that means with a boat. A boat leads away. They are in your wake, whether you want them to be, whether they want to be or not. That means whether intentionally or unintentionally, you are influencing people around you. And you're either influencing them for the negative, or you're influencing them for the positive, all depending on how you live your life. That's why we need to be intentional about reflecting the characteristics of Jesus of Christ in our life. We have to be mindful that we are not citizens of the United States first. We're not Alabama fans first. Come on. No, I'm, we're not. We have, I'm an Alabama fan. I make no, no bones about that. But I'm not an Alabama fan first. I'm not, I'm not a citizen of the United States first. I'm a citizen of the kingdom of God first. And that has to be the overruling thing of my life. That has to be the umbrella that I live under, is the fact that I answer to God and God alone. Well, and my wife at times, most of the time, right? All right, all the husbands say yes, amen, all right? That's what we have to realize. When, when we live lives that reflect the character of Christ in an authentic way, then everyone who's in your shadow by proximity, okay, or by choice, or by divine accident, as I like to call it, have the opportunity to move on to the agenda of God. 
God has an agenda for every person. I know you're not ain't been to me this morning, but I'm not going to take the mean that I'm doing a bad job. I'm going to take, that's too much turkey and too much pecan pie this weekend, okay? I'm here to tell you, God has an agenda for every person he allows to have breath in their body. You are part of the process that brings those people who are living within your shadow onto the agenda of God. And if you're not doing the right job in doing it, if you're not doing a good a job in doing that, if you're not reflecting the characteristics of Christ, then your influence is negative and you're not helping them progress into a closer walk with God, even if they're unsaved. See, I, you know, you know, my, you know I, I don't take credit for it. I don't know who came, came up with the idea. But there's a number line in God's kingdom. A negative five is as close to Satan as you can get. Please do not imagine somebody right now that's a negative five. And then you got positive five, who is as close to God as you can get. That's as close to God. And we're all on that number line where zero is the point of salvation. For you math guys, you know what I'm talking about. Zero is the point of salvation. So whether that person is at negative five or one, how you live your life is either going to help that person grow more into the plan, more into the agenda, more into the likeness of God, or you're going to hinder it, even if they're unsaved. There's plenty of people who are unsaved who will not give Christ their life because of the way other Christians, or should I say, the way Christians are living their lives. We can't say one thing and live another. You have to understand everything you say, everything you do influences those who live in your shadow, whether they want to, by choice, they have no choice, or by accident or divine accident. You have to understand that. Your shadow either helps them live in, progress forward towards God, or hinder the person in their God-likeness. There's no way to avoid the influence that you have with your shadow. None. The second thing to remember about your shadow is that it, it is consistent with your life. Your shadow is consistent with the way you live your life. Too often we try to project an image of what we think we ought to be or what we think other people think we ought to be. Hear me. We project this, right? We are projecting it, right? We try and act the way a Christian should act when we're around others. We try to say what a Christian would say when we are around others. We post spiritual things on our social media. We wear the Christian t-shirts. I saw a lot of people wearing Christian t-shirts yesterday that were not acting very Christ-like. I can tell you right. Some of them said, saved by grace. And I want to say, amen. What are we doing? We're staging. We're putting, in our, putting on our mask of religiosity, right? We're projecting. We're trying to project something that we actually aren't. You can try and project all you want, but it's not really your reality. It's because why? It's not your shadow. It's not your reality. It's not who you really are. You cannot project a reflection as different from the reflection of your true self. And that's what I want to try to help you understand. You influence people whether you want to, and then your shadow is consistent with your life, which means what? People in your shadow will never encounter love, kindness, compassion, right? Uh, uh, grace, unless it's in you already. It has to be in you is what my point is. You can talk about it all you want to, but it's not going to be you unless it's in you. You're only going to project who you really are. When the pressure comes in and you squeeze a lemon, that lemon can look pretty. You can paint that lemon to look like an orange. You can paint that lemon to look like a cherry. You can paint that lemon to look like a, 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 a watermelon. But when you squeeze it, what is really inside is going to come out. And so it is with you and I. Who you are is what they will encounter, what they will feel, no matter what you try to project. So know that. So what's my point? Quit projecting. Be authentic. Now that doesn't mean go out and live like the devil. I'm just saying be authentic. What's in you will come out. We're going to continue because now we're going to work on you. Third thing I want you to understand and remember is an impactful shadow comes from a life impacted by God's ongoing work through the Holy Spirit. If you're trying to project this, and that's not who you really are, quit trying to project that. Now let the Holy Spirit come in and work on you and be working within you. So why? So you can, you can cast the shadow that you need to be casting. I love Jeremiah 18. Turn over Jeremiah 18 with me. Jeremiah chapter 18. It's in the Old Testament. Jeremiah 18. I'm, I only put my starting scripture up there because I want you guys to use your Bibles today so you can mark them. 
This is a great one to remember. Jeremiah 18. I'll give you just a moment as you turn there. Did I tell you what the turkey said to the hunter on opening turkey day? Okay, just want to make sure you got that. Quack, quack. Yeah, okay. Y'all got that. Okay. Jeremiah 18. Did I tell you one about the apples? Yeah, okay, good. Yeah. Did I tell you about this guy by the name of Glenn? Oh, well, no, okay. Jeremiah 18. All right. Let me get serious. An impactful shadow comes from a life impacted by God's Holy Spirit. Listen to what the Lord told Jeremiah. The Lord gave another message to Jeremiah. He said, this is verse 1, now verse 2, go down to the potter's shop. God's into object lessons. I love this. Go down to the potter's shop, and I'll speak to you there. I'm not going to speak to you here. I want you to go to the potter's shop, because I'm going to speak to you, and I'm going to make an impact in your life of what you're going to see. So I did as he told me and found the potter working at his wheel. Verse 4. But the jar he was making did not turn out as he had hoped. Okay. So he crushed it into a lump of clay again and started over. So Jeremiah witnesses this. Now listen to what the Lord says. Then the Lord gave me this message. O Israel, can I not do to you as this potter has done to his clay? As the clay is in the potter's hands, so you are in my hands. Don't you love that scripture? What an object lesson. Get some, get some Play-Doh and go home and, and get some Play-Doh and make something when it don't turn out. Crush it and mold it back down and start all over again. That's what this message is about. This is a great message of hope and promise. God is the potter. We're not the potter. We try so hard to mold and make our lives what we think God wants. And God says, let me make it what I want it. You what? You stay on the wheel and let me work on you, okay? You're the clay. So the first thing I want you to know is God laid this on my heart is that each of us, we, we, we um, know that, it, that the negative shadow, if you live within a negative shadow uh, growing up or a shadow of absence in your life, you don't have to be defined by that negative shadow in your life or the absence of a shadow. That's the first thing you need to know. Did it impact you? Yes, it does have an impact on you. But it doesn't have to define you. So understand that this morning. Is as you were growing up, you lived in the absence of a shadow. You had parents or a parent that was there but wasn't there. Or you lived in the, under the shadow of somebody that set a very bad example for you. That had an impact on you, but it does not have to define who you are. If you allow God to make you and mold you and work on you, you don't have to be what the environment you live within. You don't have to be like that. And there's a lot of hope and a lot of promise in there. But we, we also have to remember that God is in the business of molding or transforming clay. We're clay. And you and I into an image of vessel. What is the image he wants to make us into? You know what it is. It's the image of Christ. What kind of vessel does he want to make us into? A vessel of honor. A vessel of honor that he can pour his Holy Spirit into. So that through us, he can then pour his Holy Spirit out of to those around us as we cast a shadow, as we affect, as we have the impact on those who are around us. But you have to yield to the potter's hand. Can I tell you some great news? My wife needs to hear this today. She needs some great news. Babe, God's not done with me yet. Well, y'all didn't have to amen that. That was for her to amen. Church, God's not done with me yet. There's your chance, right? And the good news is God doesn't have to be finished with you. God is simply telling us here today, hey, look, you play, you lead, you stay on the potter's wheel. And you keep letting me mold you. And listen, that sounds like a negative thing because you know what? You, you may have projected so much in your life what you think you should be, what you should stay, what you should look like, that God may have to just go... And start all over with you again. Let me tell you something. That's not easy. That can be painful. But I'm telling you, if you allow God to mold and to make you, to shape you, you will be a vessel of honor that he can use to change lives around you. You will cast a positive shadow that will impact lives. But you have to be willing to let the Holy Spirit do it. The question has to be asked, do the people who live in your shadow see the fingerprints of the potter? Right? I mean, if you've done any kind of pottery, if you play with play, I've never done pottery, I can admit that, but I've played with Play-Doh sculpturing clay. That's just a fancy way of saying adult Play-Doh. I've done that. And I noticed that it always seems to have some kind of characteristics of the one who molds it, some kind of marking. Because hands are different, thumbs are different. Anyways, you get the idea. The question is, can the people who live in your shadow, whether it's 
proximity, whether it's divine accident, those who have no choice and those who do have choice, do they see the marks of the master potter on your life, on your vessel, on who you are? I know that that right there hurts me because i got to reflect. It's like, well, did I really reflect the love of Jesus yesterday as well in that crazy store? Look, you, you got. I, I will never go into again on the day after Thanksgiving. It was like, and I'm over there in the corner going, oh, Jesus, just help me get out of this place. The people, if I didn't have a mask, they'd see my lips moving. I was just praying. Let me ask you another question. When's the last time you felt the hands of the potter shaping you? See, God, God, we, we struggle with this sometimes. And, and, and I understand the tension with this. God doesn't expect us to sin, but yet he gives us grace. So it's almost like, okay, we, we, we got an out. Or, or God doesn't, God expects us to be perfect. Do you know God does expect you to be perfect? He does. He expects us to be working or allowing him to work on us to become into the imp- Jesus was perfect. He expects us to be that. But, the, but he gives us that grace. He gives us that time. But we've got to allow him to work on us. See, I, I believe God, I believe, I believe what God is wanting from us. And I think what the world needs from us is authentic Christianity. You know, one of the greatest compliments I can get is when I'm out in public. Is, well, we didn't even know you was a, a preacher or a pastor. Well, that doesn't mean I live a hellish life. That just means that I'm just like everybody else, and I'm have, I, I, I'm going to have a good time. I don't have to have substances. Well, sugar definitely helps make a better time for me. But you know, I don't I don't need I don't I don't need what the world needs to have a good time. I have Jesus, and He gave me life. And you know what He wants me to do? He wants me to live my life abundantly. He wants to bless me, and He wants to live my he wants to live his life through me and i i'm sorry i don't see jesus in the bible as being boring i don't i I can say hey guys watch this i can hear jesus hey watch this watch this watch this watch this guy right here i'm gonna spit and i'm gonna spit in his eyes and he's gonna see watch this watch this right not being funny but just saying i can see hey guys watch you think that last one you saw good wait you're gonna see something even see my point he wasn't a stick in the mud. If he was, I don't think people would want to follow and hang around him. Now, what drew them was his love, his acceptance, and the way he spoke. No doubt about it. No doubt about it. I don't mean to minimize his impact. I'm just saying he, he wasn't a stick in the mud. And you know what it tells me about God? God's not a stick in the mud. He wants us to have a good time. Jesus said, you see me? You see my father. Just like if you see me, you see my dad. Let me continue. The fourth thing to remember is that your greatest impact does not come from your access to many. Your greatest impact does not come from your access to many. Your greatest impact comes from your access to a few. I want you to focus on that. A few. This is the people who are in your proximity to you. Okay. This is a reality even for me. Let me, let me throw this at you, and I'm, I'm, I'm going I'm, I'm to quickly come to the last point, but I want to throw this at you. I cannot have an impact on every one of your lives. I can inspire you, and I hope in today's message inspires you. Okay, I hope today's message changes the way you think. I hope today's message inspires you to put yourself on the potter's wheel and understand that your shadow has an impact on those around you, your children, your family, your co-workers, your, your church parishioners, the people you come in contact with. I hope that you're gathering that, but that's just an inspiration. I can't impact you. For me to have an impact in your life, i got to spend more time with you. And there's not enough time or enough for me to spend enough time with each one of you to have the impact that I think God wants in your life. That's why you need other godly relationships in your life. See, small groups and things like that. 
okay? I, I can't. All I can do is inspire you. I cannot make an impact in every one of your lives. And we see that, through, we see that in life, don't we? Jesus, he may have had the multitudes following him, but in reality, there's just a handful of people he made an impact in their lives. And of those 12, and for sure. And of those 12, three were closer to than any other. And of those three, only one was as close as any of them. See? It's that idea of impact. I think, I think about this. I think about Nicodemus in John chapter uh, 3. Right? He came to Jesus, and Jesus one-on-one made an impact in his life when he talked about that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That's where we get John 3.16. That's a conversation with Nicodemus, a man who had to come, who was part of the priesthood. He says, I got to know, are you the Messiah? He came at night to, to hide his identification so people wouldn't see him going to Jesus. But yet Jesus made an impact. And it's believed, we're pretty sure, that Nicodemus was one of two men who helped take Jesus off the cross. That was the impact that Jesus made on his life. How about Zacchaeus, the wee little man, my wife's Bible hero? Jesus comes along. Nicodemus wants to see who is this man named Jesus. Hey, Zach, is coming down. I want to go talk to you. Goes to this house. We don't know what Jesus said, but we know he made an impact because he gave back everything he sold, and then he gave up four, four times what he had earned. And, and, he, and Jesus says, salvation has come to this house today. It, it wasn't a crowd. It was a one-on-one. It was that, that man right in front of me at the time. It, it was a divine accidental meeting, if you want to call it that. God knew it was going to happen. Nicodemus didn't know it was going to happen. See, it's that one-on-one. Think, think about the lady at the well, the Samaritan lady, the woman at the well. Jesus stays at the well. He doesn't go into the village. The disciples go into the village, and here comes a woman at the well. We know she had several husbands living, living with the man and not married to the man she's living with now. We, you know the conversation that Jesus had with her, and then suddenly she goes back into the, in, into the village. What had happened? That one-on-one conversation with her made an impact on her life that when she went back, almost the entire village came back with her to see who this man was who knew everything about her life. I love it. John 4, 39. Many Samaritans from the town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. Her testimony. Why? Because she had a very negative shadow that changed instantly when she met the Messiah. For them to come out that quickly, they knew something was different about her life. Because Jesus had made an impact. That one-on-one meeting. He told me all that I ever did. Her shadow changed. You know what? And This should be encouraging to all of us. For many of us, we've really messed up in our past. Come on, we've got, a, we've got a dark shadow of our past. We've done things in our past that we're not proud of. We've been damaged to those who have been in our proximity, those who have come along in our life. We've done these things, but the good news is, is that's not the way it has to stay. If you put yourself back on the potter's wheel, he can change you, and he can take the mess of your life, and he can make a message out of it, just like he did the Samaritan woman. I'm telling you, church. We have to grasp this. You have influence on people whether you want to or not. And we have got to allow, we have to allow the, the touch of the master, the potter's hand, to transform us, to mold us into the image of Christ so that we have a positive influence on those who come into our proximity. See, inspiration happens from a distance and has a short shelf life. What I'm preaching to you right now has a, many of you are going to go home and eat and you're going to fall asleep and forget what I even preached about today. This reality. Thank God it's online. You can go back and listen to it again. Inspiration has a short, short shelf life. Impact needs proximity to be lasting. See, we think stages and we think crowds. God thinks coffee shops and relationships. If you're going to drink coffee, make a positive impact with your barista, whatever they call that person. Barista, thank you. Loose my tongues, Lord. The guy that makes your coffee. There's your interpretation. Right? We, we think crowds. Jesus did his greatest ministry one-on-one. Not the crowds, not the stage. 
we see websites and followers and God sees doing life together. Don't look for a big crowd. Look for a relationship. Notice the one who's standing right in front of you that is living in your shadow. So your shadow has influence. Your shadow is consistent with your life. An impactful shadow comes from a life impacted by God's Holy Spirit. Your greatest impact is on a few. And the final thing I want to give you to help you have an, in, a, a, an influential shadow, an intentional influential shadow that impacts people is this. You have to obey God's impulses and take a risk. You have to take risks. They say the, the most dangerous statement is when a redneck says, watch this. Some of y'all know, y'all been there. <laughs> That's not the great. The, in reality, it's not even a risk. You, you have to step out and walk in obedience to the impulses that God gives you. And you know what I'm talking about. We... We, sometimes we walk through life and it's all about the destination of the next spot we're going. And, and suddenly someone having a bad day, someone comes into your life, whatever the scenario is, and we feel that little tug. You ever felt that little tug? I'm sure. And yet, it's like, I don't know if I can do this. And all God is saying is, step out in faith, take the risks. See, we think the risk is, what if I'm rejected? What if they don't receive me? What if they don't like me? We're fearful of the rejection. And from God's viewpoint, vantage point, there is no risk, right? He said, if you step out, you're walking in obedience, you're planting a seed. You might actually be the one who harvests. You may have a harvest that day. You don't know. Some plant, some water. When God's ready, and when that person's ready, the increase comes. It, this, it's, it's, you have to be obedient, but let me get, can I let you off the hook for just a minute? You have to be obedient, step out, whew, but their salvation doesn't depend on you. It depends on you being obedient. If they re- what did Jesus say to his disciples? If they don't receive you, what do you do? Just knock the dust. And that doesn't mean be ugly. That just means, okay, Lord, I haven't been received. I move on. But we have to be open to take that risk. See, we've got to be open to go out on a limb, not knowing whether it's God. Or in my case, my wife's cooking at times, right? Actually, I can't say that. She cooked a phenomenal meal this Thanksgiving. You have to go out on that limb. See, what I found... What I find that is hard to understand is people who say, but if I approach them about this or that, they're gonna, they're, they're, I'm going to lose them. I'm gonna, they're going to reject me and I'm going to lose them. Obviously talking about family members or somebody close in their proximity. And my question or my statement is always, how much farther away from you can they be if they're not serving God? We're so afraid. We're so we're so afraid to lose acceptance that we're willing to sacrifice their eternity, separated from God. And I would rather step out and be rejected, knowing that hey, I love this person enough to be honest with them. It doesn't mean I'm judgmental. Just simply sharing the gospel. That's what Paul says. I'm going. Paul preached Jesus. Every one of his messages is about Jesus. Now, when he wrote letters after people were saved, then he did the correction. That was the Holy Spirit. And what we have to understand, we have to learn to come before the Lord, allow him to work on us, understanding our shadow makes a difference. It's influential. And as he works on us, we step out in faith and we share the gospel with people. It is not that you have to preach. It's just simply you're having a bad day, I see. Do you know Jesus loves you? Do you know who he is? Yeah, I know who he is. Great. If he's Lord of your life, then you know you have him, and he's, he's going to help you. But if not, let me introduce you to him. Can, I mean, how hard is that? Well, you're the preacher. No, you're the preacher. See, and your life is preaching a message, good or bad, with the shadow you cast.
Amen? I think we need to reflect on that. I think we need to be aware of that. This is great what we have. I'm so glad to see a crowd like this this morning, every Sunday after Thanksgiving with all the travel and sickness. But as, as good as this is, it can be better. How can it be better, Pastor? If we just had one person brought today that was unsaved that you reached for the kingdom. And the reality is, every one of you knows somebody. But out of fear or busyness, you won't reach out to them. I wonder what they'll say on Judgment Day. I often wonder if God would allow us to see the people we failed to reach out to on Judgment Day. I don't think He will. I don't think He will. But what if He did? Man. Father, I believe I've been obedient today in sharing this word that you've given to me this week, God. And Lord, I don't want this to be a message. I don't think you want it to be a message of condemnation. I think it's just a message of reflection and encouragement, God. We all have influence. We all have a shadow that we leave in the people's lives that live around us, God, and people that we meet, Lord, people that we work with, Lord. And I think there's times that we just have to be aware Especially when those times where things aren't going our way or we're frustrated, Lord, or something happens unexpected that catches us off guard. It's in those times, Lord, that what's really in us is what comes out. And Lord, we need to be reflecting on what's really in us, God, and letting you work on us. God, because I'm not here casting stones because, Lord, I live in a glass house. And Father, you and I have had that conversation more than once this week. But Lord, it's just a time that we need to reflect on on a shadow, on the impact our lives are making, God, on our children, God, on our co-workers, Lord, on those people we meet every day just by accident, Lord, divine accident, God, and, and just reflect on how am I living my life? How am I impacting those around me? Am I a light? Am I salt? Or, Lord, am I casting a negative shadow for your kingdom? Lord, I can't answer that for these people. Lord, only they can answer that question for themselves. So I pray, Lord, right now that your Holy Spirit starts ministering to them right where they are. Lord, not with a condemnation, but Lord, with encouragement. We can do better. We can live aware of those around us who don't know Jesus. And that's not a judgmental way of living, Lord. That's a reality of looking for the open opportunity to share your love with somebody who needs to hear about the gospel, the good news of Jesus. If we truly have the good news, then Lord, why would we want to keep it to ourselves? Lord, when babies are born, we celebrate, Lord. When engagements are made, weddings, marriages, we celebrate, Lord. When we meet milestones in our jobs or in our lives, we celebrate, Lord. When our kids' teams win the championship or win a game, Lord, we celebrate, God. We share the news. Lord, may we learn to share the news of what Jesus has done for us. Because it truly is the best news to share. It is the good news. And I thank you for it in Jesus' name. Now, Father, as we prepare to leave this place today, I pray that this message goes with us. The first challenge is going to come as we leave this church. It may come with somebody in the foyer. It may come with somebody in the parking lot. Lord, it very well will probably happen on 231 in the restaurant wherever we go to eat. So, Lord, as we leave here today, help us understand those people we're coming in contact with, Lord, the shadow that we're leaving in their lives. Now, Lord, bless us and keep us. Lord, we are your people. God, may you make your face to shine upon us, God, and be gracious towards us. Lord, let your grace extend to us, God. And Lord, may you lift up your countenance upon us, God. And may we receive the peace that passes all understanding, the peace that comes from knowing who you are in a personal way, God. And Lord, may we be reminded that your name is written upon us, God, as we go our way. In Jesus' name, amen. Love you, church. God bless you.
Thanks so much for being here online with us today. If today's message touched you and you haven't given your life to Jesus, we believe today is the day. All you have to do is pray. Admit to God that you have sinned. Believe that Jesus died for you. And confess that Jesus is Lord of your life. If you prayed that prayer to God today, please reach out to us and let us know. We have some digital resources that we would love to send your way to help you and for us to be able to connect with you. Make sure to stay connected with us throughout the week on Facebook and Instagram. Make sure to like and subscribe and share our social media accounts. We believe that church is more than just a building or a Sunday experience. We look forward to connecting with you online and in person. Thanks again for being with us today.